So our next speaker comes to us from the UNR Ecology, Evolution and Conservation Program, a PhD student. We're very honored to have him. Mr. Israel Wakini. He's originally from Nigeria, where he completed his undergrad and initial postgrad studies, earning a master's degree in botany. His research involves lots of things about plant ecology and photocytochemistry. And today he's going to tell us about his greatest hits tour of Charles Darwin's life. It's a really cool talk, and I'm really excited to hear. So, Israel, please. Thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, so I'm from Nigeria, as I said, and I'm studying, uh, doing my PhD program in ecology. And um, I got to know about Charles. Today I'll be talking about uh, the, about the pedigree, education, the pre voyage trips of uh, Charles Darwin, his voyage, and uh, how he wrote the original species, his family life, and other things about Charles Darwin till the day of his death. And how I got to know about this program is basically uh, about Charles Darwin is through um, a training program that I went to do in uh, Shrewsbury in England, in which we learned about naturalist skills and we also went through uh, Charles Darwin's uh, landmarks. So, Charles, of course, uh, without wanting to insult your intelligence, Charles Darwin was born on February 12th, 1809, and he was born in this place called the Month, the very house called the Month, which is in Shrewsbury in uh, Shropshire County in England. And he was named Charles after his uh, uncle, who died a few years earlier, and Robert was his uh, middle name, which was named after his own father. And uh, yeah, this is the house, several years, picture taken several years ago. But today the house has been sold and it's now used as a tax office in Shrewsbury. <laughs> but they still maintain a few of some of the um, structures in the building, uh, which we saw. And this is the room where he was born and this fireplace was believed to have been the original fireplace when he was born. But most of the other structures in the room have been taken out. And uh, yeah, so this is a. So this is a. This is a map of England, and this is Shropshire County, and Shrewsbury is within Shropshire, and this is the map of Wales. Okay, because we'll be talking about Wales as well. And he was baptized in this church, St. Charles Anglican Church in Shrewsbury. We were there a couple of, um, when I was in UK on that training program. And, and Charles Darwin was born into a wealthy and free-thinking family. Um, and this is more or less like a, the pedigree of Charles Darwin. He himself had 10 children, who I'll be talking a little bit in the time to come. And then um, he married Emma and his, his mom, Susanna and his father, of course, Robert, and his grandfather, Erasmus. Erasmus was very learned. He was a botanist, he was a biologist. He himself wrote a book called Zoonomia, and uh, it was believed that he did a lot of work and he instilled a lot of uh, knowledge on plants into his own son, Robert. And Robert was a medical doctor who used his medical practice to treat a lot of uh, poor people in Shropshire County who were so, uh, who could not afford medical treatment in those days. And he died in 1848. Uh, Charles' mom, Susanna, died when he was 80 years old in July 1817. And he um, was so knowledge, and it was believed that uh, some of the trees in their gardens that it was actually Robert that planted them and they were still there till now. I'll show a slide on that a few uh, seconds later. And then uh, this was their family dining room in the same building. And of course, it's a big family. Charles himself was a fifth child of six children between uh, Robert and Susanna. And yes, so these are the, some of the trees that are in their gardens that were believed to have been planted by Robert, uh, Charles' father, from the knowledge that he gained from his own father, Erasmus. And of course, uh, this one painting of Charles with one of his sisters, Catherine. And behind the house, the mount, behind the house where he was born and where he grew up, 
up, there is a large garden there where it was said that Charles and his siblings would always go down there to play and uh, watch different animals and plants and insects. And the border of that uh, garden has the longest river in UK, which is River Seven, which is like 220 miles, cutting through uh, Shrewsbury. His education, he started his education in a day school in 1817 in a Unitarian Church School, which was actually the church where he and his siblings and their mom, Susanna, goes to, even though he was uh, baptized in uh, Anglican Church. And by the way, I'm very sure you know that Anglican Church in the US, we call it the Church of the Episcopal Church. Or, so uh, that's the same thing. But when his mom died in 1817, their father had to send him and one of his siblings, Erasmus, to the boarding school, which is the American um, school in Shrewsbury, where he was till 1825. And this is the building here, which was that uh, boarding school, but today it is now the public library in Shrewsbury. And when the, he and his brother finished the education in 1825, they built a small tool shed and they were doing some experimentations on chemistry, on rock cooling and uh, crystals and things like that, on chemistry experiments. And after that, his father sent him and his brother to study medicine. They would send the two of them to University of Edinburgh to study medicine. But interestingly, Charles found uh, lectures to be boring, and the sight of blood made him nauseating. So he was really irritated by that, and he was so sure that he wasn't going to. He started missing lectures. He got to know this man, Reverend Professor Robert Edmund Grant, who taught him a lot about geography and marine invertebrates. And so he was keeping lectures and was doing his own independent studies on marine invertebrate collection. And his father realized that he was wasting money on him in Edinburgh and sent him to Christ College, Cambridge, which is now known as Cambridge University, where he was asked where he was to study divinity and uh, philosophy. And of course he did that and he graduated in January 1831. And uh, while he was there, he got to meet one of his cousins who introduced him to a beetle collection. And he met this dude, um, Reverend Professor Sedgwick, who introduced him into naturalist collection, uh, into geology studies, and also he met this Professor Reverend John Stevens Enslow. In those days, Oxford University and Cambridge University were established by the Anglican Church, so most of their professors, uh, their lecturers were actually both priests and uh, professors. So most of them were Reverend Professors, Reverend Professors, and this and that. So. He learned from these people, and these were more of his uh, mentors who taught him a lot of things about geology and uh, natural uh, nature studies. And when he graduated, oops, okay, um, Devil's Kitchen, and it was usually, it was previously believed that that depression was caused by some water movements and um, water actions, but he never believed that from his own um, understanding and discoveries and eventually, later on, it was confirmed that Charles was right. And this another picture of Devil's Kitchen and he believed that it was a sink line and when Professor Sedgwick visited Snowdonia with him, that was confirmed and this is some of his description of the places he visited. And this is Darwin's border. He did a lot of work in Snowdonia and went a lot of hours and hours of hiking. And um, it would take some time to rest and relax. And this was found to, real, uh, to be known as Darwin's border, where he used to sit down and relax. And part of Snowdonia. And he also visited other places as well in uh, North Wales, doing some rock collections. This is someone who didn't study geology originally, but he has a lot of knowledge and exposure in that, and he was able to do a lot of work with uh, rock collections. And eventually, because of all his findings, uh, Professor Sedgwick had to visit him from Cambridge, and they went on a trip together to, and this is the route of the places they visited, 
and they went to Wales and see some of these other uh, geological uh, areas or points of interest. And by the time, it, and these are some of the places some of the, they visited and some of the uh, rocks that were collected. However, now regard, going back to the voyage, while he was away with Sedgwick on that trip in August 1831, Professor Ensler got an offer to join the voyage, but he turned it down because it, was, it belittled him because he was to be a junior naturalist. And instead, they recommended uh, Charles for that position. And by the time Charles came back from that trip with uh, Sedgwick in end of August, he got the letter. And he accepted it, but he has to pay for it, and he doesn't have the money, but his father was really wealthy, but his father felt like that's going to be a waste of money. But eventually he was convinced by um, one of their in-laws, Josiah Wedwood, who happened to be the father of Susanna, uh, Susanna Wedwood, that um, Charles eventually married. Uh, Emma, sorry, uh, Emma Wedwood, that eventually married. And he got the offer, and uh, they went on the trip. Finally, the trip sailed on the 27th of December, 1831. And I will not, um, I'm very sure you know a lot more about the places he visited, uh, Patagonia in Argentina, a lot of places, Galapagos Islands, and several other islands he visited in South America, in uh, New Zealand, uh, part of South Africa, and other places that he visited. And of course, and some paintings that were done of the ship, and there we come to the fossils that he collected during the trips, which were, have been um, illustrated. And all his collections are reposited in the British Natural, National Natural uh, History Museum, which I also visited and we saw those uh, fossils. And these are some of the things he collected, collected by Charles Darwin. And this dude, he collected some of the samples of this dude, uh, which are here, and several other fossils he collected, femurs, tooths, other bones. He also collected a lot of barnacles and marine invertebrates, which are actually his uh, initial interest anyways. And these are some of so many uh, collections he made and which were saved over there in the museum. And a mummified skin of slot, huge, uh, the skin which was still being preserved. And um, of course, the dummy finches that I saw, which uh, was part of uh, his, the book he wrote on the origin of species. And eventually, the ship arrived back in UK through Cornwall uh, port in October, on October 2nd, 1836. When he arrived, then he moved to, oops, then he moved back to, he moved to Cambridge and he lived in Cambridge for a couple of months and then he moved back to Shrewsbury to stay with his dad and he did further detailed studies on glaciation in Snowdonia and then it was during that time that he was introduced to one of his first cousins, Emma, and he married, and interestingly, Charles has his list of pros, what he wants in a woman, what he doesn't want in a woman. And uh, eventually, he married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, and he got married in this church in uh, January 29th, 1839. And they moved to London, and while he was in London, because of all the things he had collected while he was on his trip, he had become very popular in London, but he was an introvert so he decided to move out of London he moved to Down Village and in that mansion and that was when he started to sit down to start writing his paper his manuscripts on the origin of species and of course with this very popular uh, evolutionary tree and um, he started working on it he finished his first manuscript in, in 1842 he continued to expand on it and eventually he didn't want to publish it, He's, he was really skeptical about public criticism, but eventually he received a letter from this dude, Alfred Rosa Wallace, who had a different, uh, who had similar theories from his own independent voyage, and um, 
and then he was afraid that well he might lose his discovery to this guy if this guy published his own findings first and so eventually they jointly published uh he wrote a letter which was uh, read at the linear society in first of july 1858 and so technically the theory of evolution is not charles darwin's work alone it was joint work of this guy and charles darwin but what made Charles Darwin to become very popular was because he followed up immediately a year after by publishing his book on uh, the origin of species. And by the way, the word evolution was never used then. It was actually transmutation that was being used at that time. It was in the sixth edition, I think, where the word evolution was first used. And also the word survival of the fittest, he actually adopted it from someone else which appeared first in his fifth edition of that same uh, book. And then after that, there was this uh, famous debate which I'm very sure many of us must have heard about between from, uh, Professor Thomas Oxley because Charles Darwin was always, uh, uh, he always tried to avoid uh, public debates about his theories and his findings. But this guy was really, was pugnacious. He really wanted to do anything and he doesn't care about what people say and they had this very um, popular debate with this uh, priest who also knew a lot about science so it was but eventually uh, it was like no victor no vanquished but one important thing I must say is that in those days most Anglican priests who are also professors in biology and science they also believe eventually they all believe that there was creation and it was complemented by evolution. So they believed in that and it, there wasn't really any much of problem about the two uh, issues. And back to Darwin's life, the, that book, The Origin of Species, was not the only book he wrote. He wrote several other books and this, they all stem up from the research he did. And here we were taken around by one of his great great grandson, Randall Keynes, who was the son of uh, this guy, and this guy was the son, oh, sorry, of Richard, and Richard was the son of uh, Margaret Elizabeth Darwin, who herself was the son of George Darwin. Okay, so, and he took us around uh, the Darwin's garden, his thinking part, have several pictures which unfortunately I won't be able to show here. Um, and this is a portrait of the room where he did, uh, he did his writing. We were in that room, but we were not allowed to take pictures while in that room uh, for some copyright issues. Now, the garden where he did all his experiments, uh, the inside of the garden, and um, the garden taking 10 years ago, pictures taken several years ago, and current pictures, and um, more pictures about the garden. And of course, he worked with bees. Felicity, I'm sure, will be talking a lot more about the bees. I won't go into that. Um, so, he worked on orchids, and he used orchids and even his own family life to explain that it is. When you, in, when you breed between two close related parents, you always end up having children that are, you always end up having offspring that have poor fitness, which is one of the hallmarks of uh, evolution. And he used that, he used orchids to demonstrate that. And then, um, these are some of the orchids in his garden that he used for the experiment, which was still being preserved. He also worked on plants, variation between plants and animals between those are in the wild and those in domestication. And he used that to explain how variation takes place, which leads to adaptation, which was the hallmark of uh, natural selection. And then the book on descent of, of man, in which, which is probably the most popular <laughs> of his uh, findings that, uh, which actually is something that many people, creationists, don't want to, ag don't agree with, that uh, man came from old world monkeys. That was actually what uh, some of the things he explained in that. 
And he also used his own children to do some experiments on expression of emotions and how that is also similar with expression of emotions in human beings, uh, in animals as well, as you see on the next slide. Okay, so with that one, uh, different emotions and how they occur in different animals and human beings. And then also studies on tendrils and movement of plants or in climbing plants. Um, and then also very popular study he did was on insectivorous plants using Drosera species, bladderwort and sunwort and several other um, species of uh, insectivorous other plants. And and the mechanisms through which they do their um, trap insects. And then he also did some studies, particularly from orchids and several other plants on different forms of flowers. He came up with uh, the term diroecious and, and to describe some of these things. And then Francis Darwin, which was one of his children, this is the only book he co-authored with him in which they studied more about the power of movement in plants and uh, some of the sensitive plants uh, that we know of today. And perhaps his, one of his last book was on the work of worms and how worms help in the composition and how they are detritus organisms. And he used this particular well for that particular experiment to see with years how that well continues to sink gradually because of the action of the worms. Okay. Yikes. And, and of course, he also studied more also on lichens and he documented those in some of his books, but he didn't write a book directly uh, dedicated to, okay, uh, to lichens directly. Now back to his own family. Darwin had 10 children. The one he loved most was Han, which was his second child, his, or his first daughter. And she died at the age of 10, and that really struck him a lot. He also had uh, Charles Warren, which was his last child, a son who died of, who actually had Down syndrome, and then he died of scarlet fever. And one of his other children, um, the fifth or the sixth child, Mary, only lived for 23 days. The rest, they all had one sickness or the other throughout their lives, but they all survived to adulthood. Six of them are children. One of them, Elizabeth, refuses to get married and stay with their, with his, uh, with her parents till they died. So, but at least the rest, they all had uh, families and they moved on. And Anne's death really, really touched him. And uh, Randall, who took us on the trip, um, wrote a book on that, which was uh, used for this movie that was released in 2009. And Charles Darwin, who was Charles Darwin? He was an introvert. He believed men are superior to women. He believes, he also is an abolitionist, but he believes blacks are a minor race. And that's one of the social flaws or social issues that we have to deal with in evolution, in which it is believed that uh, the white man is at the top of the evolutionary tree and all others are below. And these are some of the issues that we are always tell people that we have to be, we have to soft pedal and be very careful the way we promote that so that people will not look at it in a different view and misconstrue what we're trying to say in terms of evolutionary theory. And um, yeah, he was an agnostic and, um, and several other things that he believed in. So there are certain things that Charles Darwin had been taught that he said or he did it, whereas he didn't do them. For one, he, the study of the social Darwinism or eugenics, he wasn't the one that started it and he never believed in it, even though he, he strongly opposed uh, closely related uh, parents getting married. It was this dude, one of his cousins, uh, Francis Galton, that started uh, social Darwinism, which is basically called uh, eugenics, in which people who, are, who have poor fitness should not be allowed to get married. And it was widely practiced all over the world, probably except Africa. And um, it eventually was stopped 
when the Nazi Germany did over did it, and it, it, that was how it got like um, a global um, condemnation, and then it stopped. But it's coming back again, and some scientists are already starting to advocate for eugenics as a way of um, cleaning up the human genes. Um, I will talk about that, and I have no opinion whether it is good or bad, so it's up to individual views on that. And then Charles Darwin, another thing, especially which has always been erroneously believed, which has been a huge point, a freezing point, an argument between creationists and evolutionists is that the, many people believe that Charles Darwin said that life began with evolution. He never said that. He actually, in fact, believed that there was a creator who was, that there is a God somewhere who created the who created some primordial species, and it is those primordial species that now began to undergo evolution, into to, which leads to speciation. This and this is what he explained critically in um, the Origin of Species. And several several years after he published that book. There was a lot of uh, correspondences he did with a lot of uh, creationists, with a lot of uh, evolutionists about his theory, which have been published by him or by some other people. And uh, I always just tell people, even for me personally, going through the book he wrote about uh, about uh, uh, the origin of species and juxtaposing it with um, the biblical record of uh, creation in um, in Genesis, I realized one thing that, for one, a lot of people could misconstrue Charles Darwin or misconstrue the way it was written in the book of Genesis. For uh, for example, it always said that the earth was six thousand years old, and thankfully, Jason already mentioned something about that. In fact, a lot of Anglican clergy and, and scientists in those days always believed that the heart was more than 6,000 years old. It was only in the 1950s or 1960s that divisions started happening between creationists and evolutionists. It has always been believed in those years that the two of them complement each other. There are so many um, discoveries and uh, so many evidences that prove that evolution does take place. And of course, that's several, but one thing that Charles Darwin also said was that the structure and the design of organic life is way too sophisticated to, for all of it to come from evolution. And that's what he always believed that. He believed that there are some creation that took place and then evolution occurs, which leads to speciation. And of course, we all believe today that Speciation is a byproduct of natural selection and uh, adaptation, which is one of the things that um, is being taught in evolution. So, and these are several some of his quotes that he said in the origin, in the book, uh, the origin of species, and about creation, about speciation, about evolution. But the most interesting one I want to make reference to is this one where it says, therefore I should infer from analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth descended from one, from some one primordial form into which life was first bred by a creator, which was in its last chapter of the book, The Origin of Species. And some very interesting quotes also, <laughs> funny, it says the American monkey after getting drunk on Brady will never touch it again. <laughs> and it's thus wiser than most men. Uh, well, I think so. <laughs> All right, and then, but academically, the most important uh, quote from him is that it is not the strongest, not the most intelligent species that survives, but the most adaptable to change. And uh, after he came back from his voyage, he never uh, recovered from sickness, from one sickness or the other. And uh, eventually, in March 1882, uh, he had a seizure and he died on April 19th. And eventually, and, and Carlton and Oxley the lobby, and he was buried in Westminster Abbey beside Isaac Newton and John Herschel, which were 
two great British uh, scientists. And the life of Charles Darwin, from the beginning, when he was 40 years, 45, 49, uh, 59, and pictures taken, uh, some paintings, some taken by his own children, and eventually where he was buried, and the flooring of the Westminster Abbey where he was buried. And today, Charles Darwin has become an icon. There are statues of Charles Darwin all over the place. This is the front of the Anglican school where he went to in Shrewsbury, a shopping center in Shrewsbury named after him, there was a statue in a British Museum, and even a 10 pound note has Charles Darwin on it, even though in 2017 they said they might, they are going to remove it and put someone else in there, one of the British poets might be, might be replaced with that. And uh, yeah. And there are several readings that you can do on Charles Darwin, on, on what he has said, what he did, his research, his geological discoveries. And um, if you have any question that I cannot answer here, or you cannot, or uh, might take time, please feel free to send your questions, and I'll be more than happy to answer your question. Thank you.